Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is hosted by the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, or otherwise known as IAPMO. My name is Randy Lorge. I'm the Director of Workforce Training and Development for IAPMO, and I'll be today's moderator and a speaker. Today's webinar is the third of a four-part series on how to safely reopen buildings which have sat vacant or underused during the pandemic. Today, we'll be focusing on reopening food and beverage service serving uh, related facilities. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping things we need to cover. First off, due to the large number of people attending today, which last time I checked was again, just over 300 people, we will do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible. There will be a limited amount of time for question and answer at the end of this webinar. We ask that you please use the chat option of this platform and send your questions to all attendees so that everyone can view them. Hopefully this will help eliminate repeats and allow us to answer more questions for you. As I mentioned, we'll do our best to answer your questions, but in all honesty, there may be questions that we will not get to in the time we have today. If we do not get to your questions, you can send them to seminars at iapmo.org and our staff will do their best to reply. We also ask that you consider attending our remaining webinar where we'll focus on reopening general types of buildings. I'll share more details on this webinar at the end of this presentation. Today's materials are copyrighted. Use of any of the materials for other than personal use is strictly prohibited without the written consent of IAPMO. This presentation is being recorded and a link to it will be shared at the end of this presentation. The graphics and illustrations used in this webinar are presented for educational purposes only. IAPMO does not endorse or recommend the vendor or product depicted, nor any vendor or product. This webinar shall not be treated as an official interpretation of the reference code or standards. Always refer to the complete code or standard when installing, replacing, or repairing any plumbing or mechanical system. We are now ready to begin. It is my honor to introduce today's panelists. Today we have Scott Hamilton, Senior Director of the American Society of Sanitary Plumbing and Engineers International, or ASSE. We have Laura Sehow, Education, and training specialist for the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters. And we also have Rich Benkowski, education and training specialist for the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters. And my name, of course, is Randy Lorge, and I'm the Director of Workforce Training and Development at IAPMO. Thank you for joining us. Uh, all of the, thank you all the panelists for joining us today. I'll now turn the presentation over to Scott Hamilton. All right, thank you, Randy. Uh, let me get my slideshow up here. All right, so what we're talking about today, and it, it's pretty self-explanatory, we're talking about food and beverage producing and, and servicing establishments. But just a couple examples, we have dining in restaurants, they could be fine dining, casual dining, fast food, talking bars and pubs, cafeterias, food courts, stadium or arena vending, and they should be somewhat useless with, with off seasons that, that they deal with. And also possibly food trucks, something that not people really pay attention to, but food trucks also could have the stagnant water sitting within them. These type of establishments are highly regulated. Not only do they fall underneath all the typical building and mechanical codes that every other building does, but it also deals with a lot with health codes, especially with FDA requirements. Potential hazards that are found in these establishments, bacterial growth, we're talking Legionella, water filters, sewer gas, stoppages, system damage, and also mold. So let's start with the water distribution and talk about bacterial growth. 
Typically, you're going to get the water to these establishments through the municipality, and that water that is being supplied is chlorinated. So the, the municipality is going to clean it itself, make sure that it's clean potable water that's coming in, safe for drinking, safe for food preparation. What happens, though, when the building is shut down, chlorine dissipation occurs, uh, and it causes the, the water to become aged and become old. What happens with that, then also sediment starts to, to build up and Legionella and other bacteria begin to grow in the biofilm. Maintaining required water temperatures and unused water distribution lines is also key. When a building's not being used, the hot water's not going to be as hot and cold water's not going to be as cold. They start falling into danger zones. The danger zones that we're talking about with Legionella, if you take a look, Legionella generally grows between 77 degrees Fahrenheit and 113 degrees Fahrenheit with the optimum temperature of 85 to 103. At 68 degrees Fahrenheit, very little growth. So cold water we're looking at, we want to hold 68 or lower. Growth slows and begins to die between 113 degrees Fahrenheit and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And then Legionella will die at 158 degrees Fahrenheit. But you need to be careful. Uh, a lot of people like to, to, to jump to the, the theory that, okay, well, if, if Legionella dies in hotter temperatures, then let's, let's turn up the water heater and run hotter temperatures to our hot water distribution lines. But we also have to protect the people from scalding. So scalding issues are, are another issue we have to look at. So there's a fine line between battling Legionella and protecting people from being scalded. And one of the, the tools that we can use for that is ASHRAE 12 guidelines. In the water distribution also, we're looking at water filters. Now, water filters are, are put in place to remove contaminants. When a building is shut down, sediment and contaminant buildup can occur. This could cause pressure drops in your system when you turn it back on. And then also contaminants could wash back into the water system. So you're actually the stuff that you're trying to, to, to take out and, and protect yourself from is now washing back into the system. And it could lead to a foul odor and taste. And if you look at RO systems, the pressure drop could uh, keep the water running to the drain, go to the bypass uh, line and go right into the drain. Moving on from the water systems, we also have to be concerned with drain waste and vent systems. One of the things we're concerned with is sewer gas. When a building is shut down, the evaporation of trap seals could occur. There's no water being run down the drains to, to replenish the traps with cleaner water. We really looked at smaller diameter traps and traps that are seldom used. So first and foremost, you want to make sure that you are protecting the trap seals. If you don't protect the trap seals, then sewer gas is going to enter the building. And you can see a whole list of, sewer, of, of the gases that make up in sewer gas. None of them are healthy for you. Also in drain waste and vent systems, we have stoppages that could occur. Solid waste can solidify in a drainage system. When we turn it back on and when we start flushing the systems, we never want to leave a room when flushing a water system. Be mindful of the floor level fixtures first as early indicators for stoppages. Could be the shower, could be floor drains, mop sinks. But when you're flushing and, and Randy will get into the flushing techniques, you never want to leave the room just in case there is stoppages in the waste system. Other potential hazards, system damage, leaking fixtures. We're talking valves and faucets. As it sits, you know, things are, things are put in to, to not be used. Things are put in to be used. So O-rings, seals, packings, washers, diaphragms can leak after valves and faucets are not open and closed for extended periods of time. Fittings also, the plastic P-traps um, are exposed in the cabinets, are exposed or in cabinets can form small leaks from temperature changes within the room, um, especially with the, the temperature changes that we've gone through during this, this pandemic. We, we've went through the spring season in these last two months, and, and there's been quite, quite a few areas in the country where there's been some major temperature swings. Plumbing appliances and equipment. Appliances or equipment naturally reach their life cycle and may need to be replaced. Also with mechanical appliances, a lot of them have combustion intake or exhaust. And if they're working in the common way that they can be working if the building is open, it makes it not so much of a pleasant area for, for insects or animals to build nests or nests in because it, 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 it's, you know, it's constantly air flowing back and forth and it's not, it's not good for them. They don't, they don't like it. But when a building is shut down, 
now it's not so uncomfortable. And so you have to also take into account and take a look and make sure that the combustion air intake and exhaust are free from any kind of insect blockage. And finally, for potential hazards, we need to concern ourselves with mold. Mold will grow on building materials where there is moisture produced from leaks or condensation from roofs, windows, or pipes. Mold can grow on a variety of surfaces, such as ceiling tiles, wallpaper, insulation, drywall, carpet, and fabric. And, and keep in mind, when these buildings are shut down, there's not a lot of air movement that's taking place in these buildings. So mold is definitely a concern. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to take us the rest of the way. So Laura, let me give you control here. And Laura, it is all- Okay, thanks, here. Scott. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Laura Seha. I'm the training specialist with the UA Education and Training Department. Today, I'll be talking to you about reopening your food service establishments post COVID-19. FSCs cover a broad range of businesses that include convenience stores, restaurants, ice cream shops, grocery stores, cafeterias, et cetera. And the concern today is that it's not just one business or FSC that's reopening, but it's thousands because of the COVID-19 shutdown. So how is reopening after COVID different? It's different in two ways. We have added safety procedures we need to follow and it's on a very large scale. In the past, maybe one or two businesses in your community may have sat unused for months, but because of COVID, thousands of businesses and buildings have remained closed for many months. And if we don't reopen safely and responsibly together, we could contaminate our plumbing systems and our drinking water. Here's a list of the plumbing systems inside your FSCs we will be covering today. All of these systems listed need to be inspected, serviced, and cleaned prior to reopening. Let's start out by looking at some of these water using devices. These devices are directly connected to our municipal drinking water systems. And unless you want coffee coming out of your bathroom faucet, we sure do need to ensure that the required backflow devices are installed and are properly working. To restart commercial dishwashers, always refer to the operation and maintenance manuals or the O&Ms for, for servicing. Use proper procedures to remove debris and proper chemicals for descaling and disinfecting. Equipment such as ice makers and espresso machines need to be descaled and sanitized. Again, refer to the operation and maintenance manuals on how to properly clean and with what chemicals. Luckily, these are easily found online and many manufacturers and product reps have YouTube videos on how to service and maintain their equipment and even sell their own cleaner. Taking a look at water treatment systems, you wanna visually inspect your water softening and water filtration systems, check for leaks or worn out parts or tubing. Flush the system and replace your parts as needed. If your system is complex and has been out of service for a long time without decommissioning, or if you're not sure what to do, call a professional and have them take a look and service your equipment and replace any filters that have become moldy. The same applies for your carbonated systems like your Coke machine. Conduct a visual inspection, check for leaks, and replace any worn or frayed parts or tubing. You might wanna have a professional here flush and chlorinate the system if you're not sure what needs to be done. And for those of you who are Pepsi drinkers, this too is your carbonated system. Take the opportunity to have your backflow devices tested, pictured here in the red circle as you normally would each year and document your results. These testable backflow devices are required on all carbonation systems to prevent illness in the case of a cross connection. You should have your backflow tested by someone who's a certified tester and a licensed plumber. They will know how to service and test these devices. Now, moving on from these water using devices, I want to, these next two words I'm going to tell you are going to be so important in the upcoming months in the fight against COVID-19. And that is deep cleaning. Now more than ever, sanitizing and disinfection systems, mop sinks and other cleaning stations have become crucial in the fight against COVID. Sanitizing and disinfection systems mix water and disinfectant to allow you to deep clean your business. Check the backflow devices on these systems and visually inspect the lines to ensure this, this system is working properly. And if you're not sure, call a professional in to help you. A properly, properly working sanitizing and disinfection system will help keep your employees and your customers healthy and COVID free.
along with, with sanitizing and disinfection systems, plumbing fixtures, drains, and backflow devices are also crucial in the fight against COVID. If your restrooms have not been used or cleaned for some time, your floor drain traps may have dried up. You will be able to smell the sewer gases. Upon inspection, if you can't see water in the floor drain, fill your floor drain first with water before flushing, then flush your toilet. If the toilet is equipped with a trap primer, the trap in the drain will begin to fill with water and the smell should go away. If the smell doesn't go away, your trap primer may not be working. What's a trap primer, you ask? One is pictured on the right. It works in conjunction with your toilet to refill the trap when your toilet is flushed. If the drains are clogged or if the trap primer is plugged or not working at all, call a licensed journeyman plumber. They will be able to test and ensure these systems are working correctly. In this new normal, proper drainage is essential to deep clean your FSEs. Other fixtures in the kitchen area that will require your attention are listed here. And anyone who's been to a coffee shop knows this sink. And only a barista would know why on earth we need four water outlets on this sink. Here are more examples of fixtures and their drains. The three compartment wear washing sink on the left requires a floor drain to protect the sink in case of stoppages and overflow. The food prep sink on the right has an indirect drain. Some of you may have never been shut down this long or never experienced what a dried out drain trap smells like. As a plumber, as much as we would appreciate the business, all you need is your nose and a bucket of water to refill these dried out traps and save yourself a lot of money. Although some retail food businesses can have dozens of floor drains and floor sinks, depending on the types of fixtures and square footage in, this, in your kitchen. You may need an army to help fill and sanitize these areas. I would always recommend a professional, if you get a professional involved. Scrapper sinks are allowed by most health departments in lieu of a garbage disposal. You will want to make sure the sprayer does not fall below the flood level rim the, of the sink and all kitchen sinks, as in the event of a higher demand upstream, a back siphon condition could occur and draw contaminated water into the plumbing system. Deep clean this equipment and make sure it's properly draining. Here again, although we have a mop, this mop sink has backflow protection as shown here, you wanna make sure your hose in your mop sink does not fall below the flood level rim of the sink. Ensure the drain is free of debris and unclogged. And like all other cleaning stations, this mop sink has taken on a huge role in the fight against COVID. A properly working mop sink will allow you to deep clean your business and keep your employees and customers healthy and safe. Randy will be discussing more about these flushing methods later on. And it brings us back to review more backflow devices. Use this time to test any testable backflow devices that need maintenance yearly. Because of the closure, it's probably been more than a year already. These testable backflow devices might not be in the most obvious place. Check under counters, behind access panels. If you are in a strip mall or other densely populated location, you your tenant space may have a separated water service with its own backflow device. Check with the landlord or property manager. The reason we need to make sure we all do this right is because we have thousands of businesses reopening at once, not just one or two. If only a small fraction of the businesses do it wrong, this could contaminate our drinking water and add to the other problems we are facing because of the shutdown, Legionella and other pathogens. If you don't know what you're doing, you need to bring in a qualified professional or ask the local health authority or inspectors to help you. They may provide inspections. Water heaters and thermostatic mixing valves need to be inspected and serviced as well. Depending on how your water heater was installed, you may have some dead legs that need flushing as, as well. Look at this gooseneck of piping at the expansion tank here in the red circle. It will need to be flushed and or replaced. Most water heater manufacturers will recommend you flush yearly. Some recommend a vinegar flush and tankless type water heaters require to scaling as well. Once again, water heaters are the ammunition we need to fight COVID. Make sure fixtures with point of use thermostatic mixing valves are also operating correctly. Adjust if necessary. Lack of use may have caused the valve to seize and not work. They may need to be serviced or replaced. And a water heater operating between 120 and 40 degrees will kill certain pathogens like Legionella and will not scald users when proper point of use thermostatic mixing valves are used. 
Some health departments require 120 degree water at each outlet, except for tempered water at the hand washing sink. Hot water and soap are the COVID killers. A properly working water heater will allow your, your employees and customers to thoroughly wash your hands and will provide your business with the ammo it needs to deep clean and fight COVID. You want to keep your water at a minimum 120 degrees at the outlet to, to 140 degrees maximum, but include the thermostatic mixing valves to prevent scalding. This is a chart showing water temperature and its effects. You want to be there in the sweet spot so that the water helps to fight pathogens but will not scald people. Moving on to grease interceptors, these need to be emptied and maintained regularly. If they were due to be emptied during the closure, it probably didn't happen, so do it now. And if you're not sure how to clean, empty, or service these grease interceptor, call a licensed journeyman plumber. And these gravity grease interceptors, if you can smell them, the cleaning and the servicing of this, these grease interceptors it has been way overdue. Usually maintenance access is under a parking space within the lot of the restaurant. These are in the lot above ground, but take advantage of the closure and the lack of cars to clean and service these grease interceptors. Moving on to fire systems, visually inspect your fire sprinkler systems. If something doesn't look right, call a professional. Your building sprinkler systems can be one big dead lead leg of stagnant water, but you need to call a professional to inspect the system and give recommendations as needed. They may need to coordinate with the local fire department. On the right, you see a grease hood fire suppression system. These are also used to shut down your gas piping in the event of a grease fire. SoCal Gas will talk more about these at a later date during a part two session of reopening restaurants, so be sure to register for that presentation. And here are some of the new safety, new COVID-19 safety requirements. This type of safety gear is now the new normal, and I would have never thought I'd have to wear goggles when flushing a toilet, but here we are. Wear an N95 type mask, safety goggles, disposable gloves, and physically distance wherever, whenever possible when servicing your FSEs. Assign each person to an area, one in the bathroom, one in the kitchen. Don't put five people in the janitor's closet. Keep social distancing. Which brings us to why should we do this? You should do it because the government, national, state, and local authorities already require it. Another national emergency does not need to be declared to compel you to do these things. But the most important reason why you should do it as a business owner is because it makes good business sense. These recommendations will keep you, your employees, and your customers safe when you reopen. For example, at the local level, as a Los Angeles city inspector for 10 years, if businesses could not show they did everything we discussed in this presentation, I wouldn't sign off their permits. Keep in mind your FSC can be shut down if the local authority having jurisdiction deems your water system contaminated or even inadequate for any reason. At the national level, most of the country adhere, adheres to one variation or other of the UPC, Uniform Plumbing Code, or model codes in their area. These codes require maintenance of existing systems, adhering to certain standards, and the chlorination requirements. These codes require that you do everything we have discussed today. But the best and most important reason for business owners to do this is once again, it makes good business sense to follow. You can keep yourself, your employees, and your customers healthy and safe. People are not going to go to your restaurant or your FSE if they get sick. And they'll probably go on Yelp and tell people about it too. So I've to, to conclude this presentation, I've created this checklist for you to use to reopen your business after COVID-19. This is a quick reference for you to have and to share, to use in conjunction with your CDC reopening guidelines. Remember, this isn't one or two businesses reopening, it's thousands. We have to do it together and we have to do it correctly. Um, thank you for your attention. Now I'm gonna pass you back over to Randy. All right. Excellent. Bear with me one.
one second. That was great, Laura. And it was a, a great checklist that you put together. And as a matter of fact, that checklist um, is located in the section to the right uh, of your of your control panel there, you will see a uh, handout section. And I've included those steps that Laura put together there for you as well. All right, so with that, I'll get started. And I'm going to be covering uh, the flushing steps uh, that you should follow uh, during the uh, reopening. Um, so the, uh, the actual document that I used to put this together was published by the IATMO group, and it can be found at the address you see here towards the bottom. Um, I've also included a copy of that document in the handouts tab as well. So before we can begin to discuss flushing, uh, we need to kind of just re-emphasize a lot of the things that have already been covered here uh, in, in the idea or in the sense of understanding the big picture. What is it that actually needs to be flushed? We're gonna be looking at systems that you may or may not have in your building or may be taking for granted that may need to be flushed. Of course, the potable water supply piping system is a must, but you may also have a rainwater catchment system. You could have a gray water system. You could have a utility reclaimed water system. All of these systems need to have flushing and disinfection treatment. As Laura was talking about, you will need to do a complete plumbing inventory of all of your water using equipment so that you include them in the flushing process. Laura talked about pre-wash sinks and having to identify those, flushing all of the water, including the water that's in the hoses uh, and any uh, other uh, attachments that may be included with that pre-wash sink. She touched on the uh, three compartment sink, making sure that those, those faucets are run and the water is flushed thoroughly through those. She also included the commercial dishwasher. And again, recommended that it's best to contact the uh, manufacturer for recommendations on flushing. She also talked about the coffee machine. Uh, definitely another thing that has to be addressed. The water lines leading to that coffee machine have to be flushed. So you'd be disconnecting the coffee machine, make the coffee maker and flushing that water line. And again, as Scott mentioned a little earlier, you're also gonna have to have some place to discharge that water. So that you're looking for a floor drain, or in some cases you may need to flush it into a bucket. Laura also talked about the carbonated uh, so or soda dispensers. So those are something else that are gonna to need to be flushed. The water that's leading to the pump, the water in the pump, water in the carbonated tank that's been mixed, and the line all the way to the soda dispenser has to be flushed. Everything that is fed with water, anything that stores water has to be flushed, including proofing ovens, steamers, any connection that goes to any of those fixtures has to be disconnected and flushed. Again, this is also a great time to check with the manufacturer for any recommendations that they may have. Don't forget things like hot food tables, waitress or waiter stations, you might have an ice making machine, uh, all of these things. Cold salad casings, everything that has water has to be flushed. It's important not to miss anything. Also, Laura talked a little bit about water heaters. Uh, we'll definitely need to have those flushed. Again, it is recommended that they should be flushed every year. One of the things you wanna take into consideration um, is that the water heater could be gas fired or it could be electric powered. It'll be important to learn how to de-energize this equipment and aid with the flushing process. And it'll also avoid any costly damage that occur, could occur if it was to be drained incorrectly. Make sure there's fresh water available. Now, I know that might sound a little bit strange, and I'm talking about fresh water available from the municipality, from the main. But if your building is surrounded by other buildings that have been closed or operating at low occupancy levels during the pandemic, the water in the, the mains could actually become stagnant. This would be a good time to check with the water utility regarding the chlorine or chloramine residual level that you can expect in your building. 
Also, don't hesitate to contact your local health department. They may also be able to advise you on the flushing process, as well as have data sheets that are available for documenting the, the procedure that you're about to follow. Laura hit it on the head as far as talking about uh, wearing personal protection equipment, just like a healthcare worker, a firefighter, police officer, construction worker, you need to gear up during this flushing process. Remember, this is the water that's going to potentially uh, have the viruses in it, like the, like the uh, Legionella that Scott was talking about. So you're going to need to protect yourself during the flushing process. Some of the things you're going to need for this flushing uh, procedure. In addition to some of the standard hand tools, you're going to need a high quality digital chrome uh, meter chlorine meter test kit. You're going to need a digital thermometer for checking water temperature. And you may need some specialty tools like anti-vandal tools for removing aerators or supply stop covers. Always check with the appropriate manufacturers for some of those for some of that equipment. Know your plumbing. Again, I can't emphasize it enough. Everything that is hooked up to water to a water line needs to be flushed with clean water. You mean you may need to contact the manufacturers of some of these products just to find out what they recommend for flushing recommendations, in addition to what I'm about to tell you. Scott also hit on making sure that there were no dry traps in the, in the uh, building. Again, sewer gas is a deadly gas and it's not something to, to mess around with. Make sure that if you walk into a building and the sewer gas is at such a level or high concentration that um, it almost makes your eyes water. That's the sign that you want to get out of there and contact uh, your local fire department. All right, while we're talking a little bit about traps, uh, Laura actually alluded to this a little bit. Uh, this would be a great time to inspect your grease traps. Uh, again, depending on the last time the trap was serviced, it might be a good idea to have it clean. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to have some routine drain cleaning done as well. Uh, to the drains that are leading up to the grease intersector. If you think about it, uh, due to the extended period of time since they were last used, the drains will have cooled down and any grease left in the drains may have solidified, which could lead to uh, backing up during the flushing process. And it's something you definitely want to avoid. So some routine drain cleaning uh, would be definitely a, a, a plus before opening up. All right. Next, um, now is the time to turn uh, all water heaters and boilers off and allow the water to start to cool. If the building has a hot water circulation system, I would also turn. I would also allow that to continue to circulate the water during this process. You're going to be running large amounts of water down the drain during the flushing process. Scott uh, mentioned it earlier, never leave a room unattended while this process is ongoing. When flushing toilets, always use a toilet uh, seat lid. This will help to reduce the aerosols resulting from the flushing of the toilet. Uh, if the toilet does not have a seat lid, find something that can be used to cover uh, that bowl to reduce the aerosols. Again, every time a toilet's flush, you're going to have some of this aerosol that's going to be released into the air. A lot of times in public uh, restrooms, you don't have a closable a lid on there. And so doing something similar to this, just taking a plastic trash can and putting it over the top of the, uh, the bowl will actually help. When flushing urinals, something that you might want to consider is covering the urinal with a plastic trash bag uh, to trap the aerosols. Same thing could go with flushing the uh, or running water through the sinks or any types of sprayers, showers, sprayers, anything that you may run into a, to, in your building that may, uh, again, create that aerosol um, that we definitely don't want to come in contact. By doing this, it'll direct the water directly into the drain. Um, just make sure that if you do something like this and you add a, a bag of sorts that you see here, all this is is a garbage bag that has the bottom uh, hole cut in the bottom and then just taping it around it, just make sure that that bag doesn't drop down into the sink and block the drain. In terms of flushing times and cycles, 
this is truly a, a time when you need to consult with a plumbing professional. This is going to vary from building to building depending on the system size and the design, as well as the flush volumes and the flow rates of the fixtures. It's important to conduct the flushing process in a specific sequence. You want to make sure that you discharge the contaminated water at the nearest valve, faucet, or fixture to where the water first enters the building. Then work your way inward so that you don't run contaminated water through the entire plumbing system. All right, step one of the process. What you want to do is you want to start down, start on the basement or the lowest level of the building at the fixture closest to the incoming water, as I mentioned. Typically in areas where your water comes into the building, you'll find a, a service sink or a floor sink or a mop sink. These are a great fixture to use to begin the flushing process. These types of sinks, faucets, typically have uh, a higher flow rate and will shorten the time needed to draw in that fresh water from the main. Next, remove any, air, any faucet aerator. Then open the sinks, faucets, cold water valve all the way without creating excessive splashing. Again, we, don't want, we want to avoid any aerosol at this point. Next, use a digital thermometer to check the water temperature and flush until the water temperature stabilizes. After the temperature stabilizes, shut the cold water off and repeat the process on the hot water side. In one of the earlier steps, I mentioned shutting off the water heating equipment. With the water heating equipment off, continue to flush the hot water side of the faucet until the temperature reaches the same temperature as the cold water. This might take a little longer than the cold side due to the volume of water that you have in the hot water system, including the tank, you know, the water heater tank or storage system you may have. After you finish, be sure to clean and replace any faucet aerators. You're going to want to check for residual chlorine using an approved digital chlorine uh, testing kit. Um, I want to add here that you, you may want to, this is definitely a time when you want to, prior to starting this, you want to check with the municipality. Not all municipalities are using chlorine. Some of them are using chloramine uh, instead. And so uh, make sure that you, you know what to test for because you don't want to get a, a false test or an incorrect test when you're, when you're looking for it in the system. Again, CDC guidelines talk about the presence of free chlorine, also known as chl chlorine residual. Um, this chlorine, again, is, is what we want in the water supply systems to inactivate the bacteria and some viruses. Okay? So we definitely want to make sure that it's there. And again, I can't stress enough that you want to contact your municipality to find out what that level is supposed to be. Step number two, continue on the lowest floor to the fixtures um, that are the farthest away from the incoming source of water. So you're going to want to work your way into the building. Whenever possible, it's recommended that you flush the toilets and the urinal supply lines first. In this drawing here, what you would do is start with the fixture that is the farthest away from the incoming flow of water and work your way back towards the supply branch. After flushing the toilets, and urinals, fresh water should be pretty close to the remaining fixtures and you can begin flushing them. Again, don't forget to start with the cold water and always remove any faucet aerators before starting the flushing process itself. Continue to test for uh, residual chlorine or chloramine at each fixture. Again, if it's not present after extensive flushing, this is a time when you wanna contact your water utility. When you completed flushing the fixtures on the lower level, uh, you can begin to repeat the process going up if you have multiple floors and continuing all the way to the top floor and getting to the final fixture. Scott mentioned uh, water treatment systems. He talked a little bit about uh, filters, uh, RO systems, point of use filters, uh, all of these types of water treatment uh, equipment. This is a great time to start to take a, a real inside look or a deep look at the fixtures and the equipment that you have. The uh, water treatment equipment is uh, certified or is, has a standard 
that standard should be the ASSE 1087. Uh, the standard covers all water treatment products that are connected to a commercial building's plumbing system. Uh, this standard was just incorporated as well into the UPC 2021 uh, code. All right, with that, I'm going to now turn the uh, presentation over to Rich. All right, thank you, Andy. Thank you for all of that uh, information. I'm Rich Bankowski. I'm with the United Association Department of Education. And um, before I get started on some of the uh, some of the legislative ideas that are out there in the published language, we did have a question uh, from from uh, someone who was posed about certifications and or uh, credentialing uh, for somebody in this type of work. And I, I, I want to show you that those things are out there and that the person that asked the question was in the green building sector, which now has really evolved into what we all understand as the high performance buildings. So in high performance buildings, we always want to remember the balance that is needed when we are saving energy on our mechanical systems and conserving water because the balance that's required is everything that Laura mentioned, everything that Randy and Scott mentioned as to water flow, water age, and water temperature. So for a very long time, we worked very hard to earn sustainable credits from different programs for lowering the water temperature and saving energy. Now to balance the public health, we need to maybe accelerate some of the pumps, accelerate some of the fans, and also manage the water temperature in ways we may not have anticipated. And that doesn't mean, and, and, and that means if we raise it in the storage tank uh, above the 120 degree, uh, then we may need to put in mixing valves downboard, downstream. So that would mean the addition of control measures. And that really gets into the heart of how legislation and published language impact the operation, even before the pandemic. I think we, we, we all know that before the pandemic, high performance buildings uh, were designed and built to operate and, and maintain different levels than, uh, than not high performance buildings. But the devices and the equipment and the uh, knowledge about these buildings has been so mainstream and normalized. For instance, uh, IAPMO at one time had a, had a, uh, a a green appendix to the mechanical code. Now that the equipment is, is affordable at, with higher efficiency rates, it became normalized into the mechanical code. The language and the behaviors that we understood became part of the uniform mechanical code. So let's go through some of this. And, and the theme here today has been about, you know, when to call a professional. And what does that look like? And we've already talked about odors or discoloration. And, and I'm going to touch on some of the air systems and, and, uh, and, and some of the water mediums too. But a lot of you that operate uh, these type of restaurants and, and establishments already have contracts and certain maintenance agreements with filter guys and chemical guys, um, uh, mechanical equipment operators, uh, plumbing, uh, plumbing services. Uh, and you also need to look at the, the required reports or what we would call now surveillance documents. And oh boy, is there not just an alphabet soup of guidance out there on the type of documents you need in today's world, pre-COVID, post-COVID, uh, when it comes to air quality and water quality in our, in our buildings. You know, so that leads us to different types of documents. What, you know, different framework you know, is it mandate? Last week for hospitals and healthcare, we talked about mandates. So we had regulatory authorities mandate a certain type of behavior. But now we hear from different, uh, another alphabet soup of CDC, ASHRAE, ASPE, IAPMO. We all start talking shorthand to each other about standards and guidelines. Well, if it's a standard, then why do we need a guideline? Well, guidelines support standards. Is a standard relevant? No, no. We're going to look at look at a couple of different states that may have adopted standards in the legislation, so then it becomes relevant. So not everything that you see out there, you know, it feels like you're getting mixed messages. But you, as an operator of a restaurant or a, a uh, 
a, a beverage establishment, you know how your place breathes. You know how your place runs. You know what the water system sound like under normal conditions, what the air, how the air system behaves under normal conditions. So in coming back post COVID, we want to reestablish normal conditions. So you'll be, we already described a little bit of the startup and commissioning and performance, and you're gonna be doing everyday work and everyday tasks that you did every day before you shut it down. So when do you call for help? Well, when you get beyond that everyday task, it may be helpful to have somebody who would know about the state legislation in your state or any funding incentives that are maybe in line if you do things in a certain way. So now even more so, it's not just state by state, it's county by county. Certain states are reopening, Maryland is reopening, but oh my goodness, there's four counties in Maryland that are still a little hot. Uh, Pennsylvania is reopening, but Beaver County right outside of Pittsburgh is still at, at the red stage. So navigating those types of uh, issues becomes makes it more complicated, more complicated than we want it to be, more complicated than sometimes we think it needs to be. So pending in Florida, and I and I posted some of the original language here for State Bill 1190, but it looks at, you know, it names, if you look at the bottom of the statement there, ASHRAE Standard 188. Oh boy, that's a guideline we, we talk about for risk management for building water systems. Well, what exactly are you managing? This standard in and of itself only talks about putting a water management team together. You put the team together and everybody has their lane. Everybody contributes to the health and well-being of your establishment and of your customers, occupants, employees. But so when this standard comes into play in legislation, then it becomes enacted, it becomes law. Inside that standard is a guideline. It says, refer to ASHRAE guideline 12. Well, a lot of the advice you got today from Laura, from Randy, from Scott, is from the good practice, good industry practice that is named and listed and described in guideline 12. So sometimes it's a matter of connecting the dots from the regulatory legislative side. When we look in Illinois, for healthcare facilities, they're saying registration and certification of water quality. So another pending bill, pending means it hasn't been passed yet, there's not an effective date yet. And it, Illinois is looking to establish registration and certification of professionals and contractors. So we'll get to some language that's available for everybody to find their spot with a credential, to find uh, and be able to use their expertise to support uh, so, some of this from some of the states. Uh, Virginia. Virginia said, well, wait a minute. Let's let's make sure the school boards maintain a water management program for the pre prevention of Legionnaire disease at public school buildings. Oh boy, what's that going to look like? Now we're saying every school has to have a water management program. Well, schools have cafeterias. Schools have cafeterias run by third party uh, third party entities that manage only the cafeteria for the school. It's, it's an outside contract. So now if the state of Virginia says and if they pass SB 410 and the school system has to have a water management program for the public school, now that goes down board into whoever the third party management system that hires the cooks, uh, the, uh, the cleanup, the bus, everybody that works inside that cafeteria is under more scrutiny based on needing a water management program, including results of all validation and remediation activities. Well, that sounds like a mouthful, but the last almost hour now, we've been talking about validation and remediation. Those things are being addressed here. So that, that's a good thing. It's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help you feel not so overwhelmed. A lot of the language, very many times we start to get overwhelmed by things coming from different directions. So even though Virginia is looking to uh, pass legislation on school boards, that also works down into the, the eating areas of the, the school. Now this one in New Jersey is already passed. For testing for Legionella, the EPA shall ensure testing be conducted by qualified testing professionals certified in accordance with ASSE 12,000. 
So that is professional qualification standard for infection control risk assessment for all building systems. But let me tell you what it really is. At the street level, this credential, when you talk about having to behave uh, uh, in accordance and compliance with ASHRAE 188, which is a water management program under the guidance of ASHRAE 12, this credential verifies and validates your behavior, your knowledge of the vocabulary. It comes down to, do you understand the vocabulary and, and how to address the plumbing and mechanical systems from this framework? Do you understand what a control measure is? Do you understand how to type a building, classify the occupant, and then say, okay, if it's this kind of building, this kind of occupant, I know what control measures to do. I know we should take the water up to 140 degrees. And oh, by the way, if we do that, the CDC says just make sure it's above 120. Some actually guidelines say above 140. Scott said if we get the 158, man, we, we kill the bacteria in a few minutes. That's great, but now what? So if we create 140 degree water, we also need a control measure to manage the scald risk to the occupants. So that takes us into a different conversation, but we understand the vocabulary. We know how these systems should behave to comply with the water management programs. So if they're complying with the programs, then if you need professional help, if you need to find that uh, professional engineer, that, that plumber uh, that has gone through and earned this credential, uh, 12,061 is the plumber's credential here. 12,062 is a credential for the guy that's going to work on your cooling towers or your ice machines. Your ice machines, a little counterintuitive because you're thinking, okay, how do I get Legionella from ice? If you chew the ice and, and breathe the vapors, that's where it's going to reside. So again, credentialing is available for people who want to engage and, and, and build you know, protect the public health and offer some way of increasing and promoting consumer confidence in the engagement just because we understand uh, how, to, how to behave with these systems, how to apply control measures, and most of all, have the conversation with the water management teams, with the owner. Say, you know, if we do this, then this will happen. If we don't do this, then this may happen. You are at risk for these things to happen down board. So here we have uh, just released general guidance from ASHRAE. Um, up until now, I've been talking about uh, pending legislation or past legislation. Now, you know, we Google everything. If you would have Googled the ASHRAE website yesterday, you would have seen fresh information. And they're, what they're offering, though, is not new. It again goes back to what's already been discussed. So what Scott, Randy, and Laura discussed with you is then verbalized at, on the ASHRAE website about making sure the traps are wet. Okay, 140 degree to avoid microbial incursion. Don't let it drop below 120. So we have a control measure range of between 120 and 140 for hot water. And as we know in restaurants, you live there. You've got to wash and sanitize your dishes and disinfect all the utensils. So you're living in some parts of the restaurant your employees are exposed to that risk of being scalded for you know, when they're managing the dirty dishes and, and getting them ready for the next customer to come in. So there's always that recommendation for PPE, but now it's epidemic level PPE. Now it's got to have a rating. Now it's got to have a little bit of training to make sure that you're wearing it properly. So it, it's a matter of just paying attention to some of the uh, some of the risks and how they impact your customers, employees, you know, trying to delineate between mandates and standards and the guideline and knowing in the county you live in, which resides in a certain state, what the expectation is uh, through state guidance. All right. We will uh, right now talk a little bit about the air side of the system. So the mechanical systems, uh, may, the fans may have been running while you were gone. Uh, the filters may have been changed before you left, but now it's back to that the basic fundamental operation of startup recommissioning and looking at performance. So you want to make sure that the dampers outside return are working properly. Again, that should be managed. Whoever, if you're 
doing your own maintenance on the systems, fine. If you have an outside entity doing maintenance contracted for it, they should return and do and do go down through the checklist. Uh, overall building pressure is important to make sure it's positive. Positive pressure means you're gonna exfiltrate to, to the outside. You're not gonna draw in air from the outside. But here's the thing that makes it most complicated for a restaurant. You got that big exhaust fan above the cooking in the kitchen above the cooking areas sometimes the exhaust fan defeats any attempt at having positive pressure in the building so makeup air is required and we all know makeup air can be expensive uh, when it's zero degrees outside you have to heat it when it's 95 outside you have to cool it so makeup air is a very tricky thing to manage uh, it, it, at this time but you want to try and make sure you have a positive where your customers are even if you're negative in the kitchen because you're drawing out the steam, the heat, the fumes, that's fine. But you may need to rebalance systems. That's something we haven't talked about. You may need to rebalance it. It's also, actually, it also recommends go to MERV 13 or MERV 14 filters. Well, that's kind of a, that's a high level rating. Only high performance buildings, anybody that's in the sustainable or green building world of high performance, knows that MERV 13 is, is kind of the, the point of departure, but go to MERV 14. That just means it's a thicker filter, it picks up smaller particulate, but also it's gonna, it's gonna put a different challenge to your fan curve. Your fan may not have enough power. You may need a horsepower motor to do that and still maintain comfort. So the fans were rated at the filter system that you have in there, whether it's a one inch, two inch, 30%, 50%, you know, Mer a MERV rated filter, but you must recognize that you're going to put an undue burden, another burden on the fan to move the same amount of air because if you, you still need to dehumidify and you still need to cool uh, the occupied space. So you have to be cognizant of uh, putting in a bigger filter to catch smaller particulate and maybe even viruses and or bacteria. But at the same time, are you going to move enough air for cooling and humidity? And Ashtray also mentions that controlling humidity and controlling the temperature is very effective at intervention with COVID-19. So you check the filters. And also, when you increase the level, the systems have to be able to, uh, to overcome it. So here's some things for compliance. We had mentioned that there are credentials out there for infection control, uh, 12,020 address for maintenance, construction and maintenance personnel about bloodborne, waterborne, airborne pathogens. It covers a lot of responsibility for protecting building occupants and operation. Uh, a lot of it directed at healthcare. And that's where at some point you may see the healthcare in the description and think, ah, that's not for me. In post-pandemic America, everything's for us. We, we need to, to have our eyes open about infection control and understand uh, what some of the safeguards are for infection control. So on the air side, 12,000 and 1220, and there's also a contractor credential, there's a technician credential, and uh, mostly for dust and how particulate moves in the air, very soon, we'll be working on a, 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 an air quality credential. When we look at 12,060 and six to 63, that covers contractors, plumbers, service technicians, and sprinkler fitters, by the way, for water quality, for understanding the risk posed by in the building and the impact to the occupants uh, on all things, all pipe systems. And I think it was mentioned earlier that it's a little counterintuitive because by design and the grace of God, the sprinkler system does not move water, but also sprinkler systems need to be maintained. Standpipes need to be flushed. So there are certain things there to protect the worker and the occupants. The sprinkler systems need as much attention as the other systems. And within that credential, you saw a lot of diagrams of piping systems where Randy was teaching you how to, to walk through and flush different parts of the system. First thing you'll do with that credential 12,060 to 63 is map your system. Get a good working map of your actual system, how it's piped, how, it, how all the systems work every day. 
brand new and ASSE is 12,080 qualifications and knowledge and competency for a water safety team, but it's on a professional side, uh, filter, uh, the guys who work in the filter industry, the chemical industry, a facility manager for, for a, uh, a, a building, uh, to again, get them with the same uniform understanding of the vocabulary of the issue for water quality and also the expected behavior. So this credential helps somebody to sort out and hire and know what the expectation is if you hire a 12,060 contractor who sends a 12,061 plumber and they fill out documents that says, we mapped the system, we audited the system, we flushed the system, here's what we think it needs. You'll find a couple of signatures on that chain of custody document that should allow everyone to manage their liability of doing everything they can do to protect public health and promote consumer confidence. So I'm going to turn it back to Randy. Excellent. Thank you, Rich. And if you have any questions in the chat box, I'll be, I'll be sure and go ahead and answer them for you. But I uh, appreciate everybody's time and thank you for tuning in. All right, Rich, you hit the back. and uh, we'll start to wrap this up. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time here for some questions. And Rich, if you just want to change the command, the uh, presenter, the present presenter mode over to me, I would appreciate it and we'll get going. Okay, I've, I've done it. You should have it. Okay. All right, not seeing it yet. Let me try this. All right, I've got it. All, all right, Rich, all right. we're all good to go. We're all good to go. All right, excellent. Um, thank you, Scott, uh, Laura, Rich. Those are some great things. Um, I just want to wrap this up a little bit here, and then we'll try to fit in a couple of questions. But um, we covered a lot of information, and. Uh, all of that information, all of our resources uh, that we have available are posted at uh, www.iapmo.org. Uh, you'll find it on our COVID-19 response page there. Uh, you'll, also, uh, you'll also find uh, more of our resources uh, in the uh, handout section. Uh, there is a complete document that you can download there. Uh, again, with many of these uh, uh, resources that we've uh, already covered here. Um, the flushing process or procedure uh, handout is there as well. The one that I, I went through uh, as far as flushing each fixture, uh, that can be found there. And um, one more thing before we go to the Q&A, uh, our next webinar is up for next week, Wednesday. And uh, in that webinar, we'll be covering reopening of general buildings, and uh, that will be at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, also, I'd like to add, uh, Laura mentioned it a little bit earlier, we are going to be running another uh, webinar in uh, partnership with SoCal Gas, and that will be uh, dealing again with food and beverage establishments, and we will be talking a little bit more in depth about the plumbing and gas considerations. So uh, please check that out. You'll be able to find that out at the uh, link that you see provided there, and I believe it was also in the chat if you'd like to register for uh, our upcoming webinars, you'll be able to check out the link there. So with that, I'm going to uh, go to the Q&A and hopefully our moderator may have some questions for us. Yeah, Randy, we do. Thank you. Um, so one, the first question is actually a follow-up to the uh, question that uh, Rich addressed. Um, the person's really kind of asking, you know, as a uh, consumer, uh, normal member of the public, you know, what is out there that uh, as I walk into a local restaurant, you know, how do I know that that restaurant has taken any steps or the necessary steps uh, to properly flush their systems and make sure that their systems are uh, safe for the public to use? Well, I, this is Rich Pankowski and I, um, this is evolving evolving every day and and right now every responsible business owner is before you walk in the door is is working very hard to protect their employees and themselves 
So, and as it evolves and things change every day, there's no established, um, you're not gonna see a gold star or the letter A or a lead credential or even a well credential. If you follow well, that is about air and water quality for buildings. It's, um, it, 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 there's too, so many moving pieces right now, uh, if, except if you ask the owner a few questions, you may not visibly see uh, the difference. Okay, thanks Rich. Um, another question that came in was, uh, you know, besides the possibility of grease buildup, are there any preoccupations or concerns with the drainage system as a whole? Uh, just as water lines have to be flushed, uh, is there anything in particular that needs to be done uh, about the drainage system? Uh, this is Randy. Uh, I'll jump in on this one. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, in addition to making sure that all the traps are filled, um, flushing a line or running water down the line prior to getting into some heavy flushing would be definitely advisable. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you are in a kitchen area, um, I highly recommend that those kitchens, kitchen drains uh, be uh, cleaned prior to running towards the grease interceptor just due to the, uh, the congelling of the, the grease that may have occurred in that line uh, during the uh, shutdown process. So definitely a good question and definitely something that should be done slowly um, to ensure that you don't have any flooding or backing up. Okay, uh, another question came in. Uh, can you please expand on the commonly used terms re residual chlorine uh, or disinfecting concept? They're, they weren't quite sure they understood the distinctions being made there. Sure. Uh, water uh, municipalities will treat the water with uh, either a chlorine to uh, safely get the water through the piping system to your business and that uh, that residual chlorine will show up on a meter. Um, the other thing that I had mentioned was that not all municipalities use chlorine, some use chloramine. And so there's two different types of treatment that could be used and a chlorine meter will not pick up the chloramine. And so you wanna make sure that you check with the uh, utility to uh, ensure you know what you're testing for at the taps. I hope that helps. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> you kill two birds with one stone because uh, another person made a comment about uh, chlorine versus uh, monochloramine. So uh, you answered that next question as well. Um, another question that came in was from someone saying that they've heard that it's absolutely critical not to turn on or accelerate exhaust fans in a building that has seals, you know, allowing sewer gas in. Um, so they're asking if uh, IATMO recommends uh, water maintenance uh, or certainly sewer traps be the first thing a building should focus on so the HVAC people don't harm occupants stemming from a plumbing issue. I'll take that one. This is Randy again. Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the very first things you want to do um, is to, before any fans or any type of equipment is turned on, could draw more sewer gas into the building is to make sure all those traps are replenished. Every fixture trap, every floor drain, as Laura and Scott were talking about, um, definitely a, a wide step to go through and make sure that that's done first. Okay, thank you. Uh, There's one comment that came in that uh, uh, one of the uh, laws that were pending that Rich mentioned, uh, I think in Virginia, uh, VA SB 410 is now law. Um, just something uh, that they're throwing out. I, I can't verify that or not. But um, and then there's another question about um, uh, one attendee was asking about what New Jersey law uh, was being referenced as passed that re is requiring the uh, ASSC 12,000 uh, certification. Um, Rich, I don't know if you have that uh, New Jersey law at the tip of your tongue. If not, we can get an answer to that individual uh, later on. Uh, let, let me check. Uh, maybe go to the next question. I have it here in my notes here somewhere. But go, go. keep going with the other questions. I'll get. I'll jump back in. Okay. Uh, well, um, we've got uh, one more uh, asking a question actually about the. Uh, uh, they're referring to the ASSC 1261. 
as a separate certification. I'm not sure if there's a 1261 or if it's just meant to be the 1260. Um, just wondering where to enroll for a uh, water condition specialist or water monitoring specialist in order to conduct water tests and uh, draft report for restaurants in LA. Um, that's probably a question that will require a little more uh, in-depth consideration and in response. Um, so we'll have to get back, probably get back to that individual uh, afterwards. But um, that is the last uh, question we have. So, uh, Rich, I don't know if you're uh, zeroing in on the answer about the New Jersey law. No, I did not. Uh, fine. We, I'll get it to you and then you can email it out. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, that, Randy, that wraps up all the questions that have come in. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, attending today. Again, thank you to our panelists. Um, if we didn't get your questions, uh, if there are other questions, remember, you can email them to seminars at iatmo.org, and we will do our very best to get back uh, to you with an answer. So with that, uh, again, thank you for attending, and have a great rest of your day.